Welcome, everyone, to today's author chat episode. Our guest today is Courtney Ostaff, whose new book is The Teaching Online Handbook. Courtney's a professional online K-12 teacher and a homeschooling parent. Uh, she's worked with students in all learning settings and at all age groups over the past 20 plus years, ranging from the very young to the elderly, and along the way has developed practices and techniques for making the most of the online classroom. Uh, Courtney, welcome to the show, and I'm excited to discuss this uh, really timely content. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I feel like I just happened to have this niche position, and all of a sudden it became what everybody else was doing. I feel like I'm playing catch up in a way. Right. Well, I think in a a lot of ways you're ahead of it. And then (laughs) as everybody else is coming into their own understanding of how online teaching works, um, probably a little give and take. But, you know, that's sort of one of the things I wanted to to start off with just in in general. I mean, you know, and and over the the past 20 years that you've really been engaging in online teaching, um, I think, for a lot of folks in education, they haven't necessarily been exposed to it either because there was no particular necessity or they just didn't, you know, it was thought of as something separate. But what are some of the reasons why educators on the one hand and students on the other um, might gravitate toward online learning as a preferred option? Well, That's a two-part question, so let me do that in two parts. So I gravitated towards online teaching because I did it as a side gig for a long time. Uh, I started out as a graduate assistant, and it was part of my graduate assistant duties. And then after I graduated with my first master's degree, I um, (laughs) was working as a temp, actually. And I saw an ad for people to teach online college classes, community classes. So I saw, oh, why not? A little extra money, right? And this was back in, oh my goodness, like 2002, <laughs> a while back. And I sort of, they hired me and I fell into it. And I found that I had a knack for it because um, I was always online anyway. Back, you know, this was before everybody was always online, right? And I I found it not as intimidating to stare at a block of text because back then it was all text-based. And I felt like I had some empathy because I had been someone who was working and going to school and raising kids. And a lot of my community college students were working and going to school and raising kids. So I kind of had some empathy there. So I really enjoyed it. And I worked into... um, I wouldn't say it was quite full time, but it was it was a pretty intensive position, and I made my living doing that for a long time. But uh, I wanted to. Eventually, I found that I wanted to go back into getting like a a regular teaching job. <laughs> so I went very slowly. It took me like ten years to get my second master's degree in secondary education. And what I look back and I see is kind of funny now is that. My goal was always to do public school teaching in a face-to-face classroom that I never thought of online teaching as a permanent position. And then when I graduated and I got a public school teaching job, um, my second child had some really major health issues and I needed more flexibility than I could get as a public school teacher. Um, And lo and behold, somebody had just started an online school and I thought, oh, I can do that. And that's where I've been over at the Well-Trained Mind Academy. And I'm so grateful for them for hiring me. And they're wonderful to work for, just great people. And it's been quite an experience because I've been working with kids from 8 to 18 all over the world. It's been fantastic. And what I find is that those students, not all, but many of them come to online learning because they need something that they can't necessarily get in a face-to-face classroom. Like I've had, you know, students who are training for the Olympics or they're professional ballerinas or they're in a hospital bed and they they can't go to school or they're Broadway actors um, or they're diplomats kids and they're living abroad, right? And their parents really want them to have instruction in English. So I work with a really diverse group of kids and it's fantastic. It is, I love my job. Every day I wake up and I'm excited to do online teaching. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, are there still, I think, I think we've had a, a different you know, perspective and, and view on this in the recent you know, past several months here with, um, with pandemic related online learning and, and some of the necessities around that. But, um, you know, either from uh, potentially some educators or parents that you have spoken with during that period who are kind of newer to online learning or, uh, or even those who maybe were really good candidates previously, um, but didn't necessarily go in that direction. I mean, are there still some holdups that you're seeing, some, some misgivings perhaps based on kind of misperceptions or just lack of awareness about um, what's really available that's kind of inhibiting some really good candidates uh, from pursuing online learning as their option? Only every autumn, because <laughs> we start classes in August and September, mm. and a lot of people are like, ooh, I will dip my toe into the water with one class. We'll try it, just this one little itty bitty. And so I have students who actually go to public school all day, and they have a study hall, and they come to my class in their study hall. So I, they're doing both. Right. And it is an adjustment for them. It really is. Um, and it's an adjustment in what they expect from the class, what their parents expect. And then it's adjustment for me to how to teach them so that we're both meeting each other's kind of expectations and needs there. And so that is a huge part of what I do every autumn from the beginning of August till the end of September as we work on making that adjustment. It's not easy and I've been doing it for 20 years. So it's not an easy job. It really isn't. Yeah. And do you expect, I mean, based on, you know, based on that 20 years of experience and then based on kind of recently more people having some exposure to some of the potential of what online learning can be, although not everybody has had it, um, you know, as in as well of a planned out experience as, as we would like, but this fall, um, I think there's a little more of that going on, but are, are there some trends that have been ongoing over time and now potentially even accelerating that maybe lead you to believe that there may be a different role for online learning in, in relationship to traditional schooling? Um, meaning, in a sense, there's a lot of online learning programs that certainly have been in place for credit recovery, for um, <clears throat> dropout prevention, you know, alternative learning or, or filling needs for students like you mentioned who are involved in elite sports programs and their schedule is, uh, you know, dictates that they need a different option. All these, you know, so online learning has served that role over the years, but now with maybe a little more of an understanding of what hybrid learning could be, that it's not either all one or the other. Um, do you, I mean, do you think that maybe we'll see more of an adoption of online learning as some percentage of students schooling, even for those who are enrolled in a traditional brick and mortar school? Absolutely. And what's really interesting is that I live in West Virginia, which mm -hmm. is not necessarily known for being a forerunner in this kind of thing. But in fact, um, West Virginia, like many rural areas, has a difficult time attracting uh, teachers, especially in math and science. Here in local politics, it's a huge flashpoint. Uh, and in fact, we have for a long time uh, offered online classes for students who couldn't necessarily otherwise access the exact kind of education they wanted, like calculus or you know Spanish four or that kind of thing. And I think some of those classes are really good. Some of them are not so great. But what I think is that hopefully as people see some of the good parts, some of the opportunities, some of the ways to do it well, and some students find that it suits them better. I mean, it's not gonna be for everybody. Don't get me wrong. I don't think that online education is a panacea that you can just hand out and it will work for everyone. But I think for a surprisingly large percentage of the student population, it can be something that is attractive and works well for them and helps them with their education. 
and I think students are definitely looking into it and parents are looking into it. Yeah. Yeah. It seems as though it, there, there are clearly opportunities. Um, a lot of them probably would be highly relevant to more rural areas or just areas that are more uh, spread out geographically related to you know, weather related concern, the things that happen every year <laughs> routinely um, that cause schools to close because of reasons that have nothing to do with school. But where is there a plan in place proactively to say, okay, it's not like we're necessarily doing online learning every day, but we know that it's available for us as an option so that learning isn't affected by these things that have been going on for hundreds of years <laughs> and and now we have perhaps a tool to to circumvent <laughs> and in fact my local school district does that i live in morgantown which is the home of west virginia university and of course it's a college town which means we have lots of professors which means that our local school district is well supported and so it's a one-to-one -one school system meaning that every student from k through 12 has a chromebook and so if the weather's bad they're like okay we're having an arctic academy day everybody stay home and do your work from home yep. and they do it they've done that for years but i will say that that's not the kind of online teaching that I do. And when I think about online classes, that's not what I think about. There are good ways to do it and bad ways to do it. And that's not an optimal method. I will say that because yeah. they're very different, um, very different job sets, skill sets. Right. Right. Yep, absolutely. And so, and you have the, uh, in a sense, unique, I mean, you have the unique role of being, um, certainly a trained and experienced online educator in addition to a you know, parent um, doing the homeschooling. So you get to see from both sides of that, you know, that's a piece that's been certainly a topic of conversation and should be a topic of more conversation, whether, I mean, in any kind of school, <laughs> traditional online or otherwise, uh, is the communication between the parties around what's happening with learning? Why are we doing this? You know, what's the plan? Uh, are you, I mean, one, just in general, um, if you want to talk through you know, kind of the best practices that you've seen over the years, the things that you really try to, to hold close, but also, you know, if there's anything you're observing more recently around that communication piece and maybe where as a whole, you know, the education community needs to get better at it, you know, and what are some of those things to really focus on? Well, I will say, and I think this is going to be controversial, that I really feel like teachers in general, but absolutely critical online, need to learn to trust parents and work with parents. I saw a poll mm, last year, the year before, and I want to, I could be wrong, but I want to say something like only 36% of teachers felt like they could trust parents to do academic things with their students, which is a really low percentage. And the thing is, as teachers who are switching to online teaching find that in a classroom you can you know give a kid the stink eye right like don't even you know <laughs> but you can't do that in online teaching you have to build a relationship not just with the student but with the the, the parents and in fact you really need to do it with the entire family when I teach, I just assume that they're casting that lesson to the TV and grandma and cousin and the neighbor and the babysitter are all sitting there watching because it happens. It happens and you just kind of have to expect it. And so when you're you're giving a lesson, you're giving it to everybody. You there is no privacy and you have to trust that they're going to follow through and you have to be respectful of their needs and their time and when you teach, you make it work not just for the student, you make it work for the family. You're really working with a family. And that's a very difficult piece to, right. you know, because different families have different expectations and different needs. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, in a sense, whereas that may, you know, for some educators, feel like it's a shift from what they're necessarily used to, um, you know, also a tremendous opportunity to have the families be a lot more 
aware of what's happening with the learning and to see that that inf- that knowledge uh, base and that information and insight and to be able to seeing here's what my child is doing here are opportunities where i can help um or where i just have a better understanding of what the teacher is doing which you know typically can be uh can make a significant difference in just the perception of the learning, not just the, you know, the proficiency and the, the, the benefits students get from, um, you know, from having their family being able to support them because they know how to and they know what's going on. Well, and I think that one of the things that I do that is overlooked by a lot of people who are new to online teaching is that I push out all of my expectations and assignments two weeks in advance because mm-hmm. families are busy people. Right. You know, um, as as the mom who makes the household schedule <laughs> uh-huh. and does the meal planning and stuff, I need to know what kind of, you know, are they going to have soccer practice tonight, right? Is she going to have an algebra assignment due tonight? I need to know that in advance so I can make plans in the family schedule to get it done. And so I try to give that same courtesy to my students and their families. And I find that it is one consistently over the years that regularity of expectations, giving parents a heads up, having a set schedule and pushing that schedule out weeks in advance makes or breaks the class for, for mm-hmm. families. That is one of the main reasons um, that they, take my classes and they tell me that right yeah that's uh yeah that's that's a a great point right and absolutely true that um we've probably all experienced it you know whether it's really the school or work or whatever that having that information ahead of time um you know really really makes planning all that much more effective uh so to to you know pivot more explicitly to the book um because we've been talking about the subject matter obviously but and one thing I'm really interested in is obviously based on your experience, your expertise, your knowledge, right? You, that, all of that is a motivating factor for getting this into book form and uh, really sharing that with, with more people. But I'm wondering about the other, you know, potentially, uh, I'm sensing obviously there are some shortcomings that recur in, in online education that really you know, maybe needed to be addressed that could be some of the motivating factors for saying, all right, I'm going to write this book and address them. <laughs> are there, what, what are some of those things that you've seen that, that just kind of, you said, you know what, these are some, some holes and, and they really need to be filled. Well, I hate to criticize teachers who have, are doing something they haven't been trained to do. Mm-hmm. That's not fair. It's not fair to them. It's not fair to their students. We've all been dumped in a giant pit of it's not fair. (laughs) That's true for everyone. But what I will say is that a lot of teachers, I feel as though they're tempted just to continue on with their normal classroom practices, but just put it on Zoom and just go. But teaching online is its own skill set, and you cannot just stick stuff on Zoom and expect it to work. It's not going to work, and you're going to be really angry, and you're going to be like, teaching online is terrible, and it's not going to work, and I hate this. I hate it all. But the truth is, it's not, you're not actually doing that. You are just trying to broadcast yourself which is not the same thing and i think i have a very different perspective on that because remember when i started there was no zoom that was not a thing like you were lucky if you're if a big email downloaded in a half an hour you know Uh (laughs) so uh for me when i think about online teaching the the synchronous sessions they're like the icing on the cake they're they're great they're lovely they're wonderful but they are not an online class that is not they're not students if you just rely on that and i've seen this with my own children um if they have a teacher who just talks at them on a zoom screen and expects that to be the class they're not going to learn anything they're really not people don't remember this and if you think about that 
you know, think about the last episode of a TV show that you watched on Netflix. How much of that dialogue can you remember point for point? Like you might remember the story plot. Oh, so-and-so got, had a baby, you know, but you're not going to remember like what color clothes they were wearing or lines of dialogue unless they were especially striking. You're just not going to remember it. And so if you want students to remember specific details, then you have to make sure it's offline. Mm -hmm. and it, so in that case, what happens offline is the most important sense of what happens in an online class, which is counterintuitive, but true. Yeah. And I mean, I, and I a sense that that speaks to you know, another significant part of what you are wanting to do with um, with just your work in online education in general is connecting research-based practices into it and saying what do we really know based on the research works uh and what doesn't work and let's do more of what works and so um you know i would sense that would point to a lot of what you're talking about here as far as that offline component and its importance and and what um you know really promotes better memory and, and retention of knowledge and all those things. Are there any other kind of particular research-based practices that come to mind, particularly those that if they are counterintuitive or just if they're not, if they're not the things that s seem to be the primary point of discussion and yet they're the things that you say, my goodness, everybody needs to be doing this. <laughs> why, don't, why don't we know this? Well, here, I'll be very old fashioned and very curmudgeonly and say, that everyone should be giving, and I don't care what class you teach, I don't care if you're teaching social studies or science or math or English or underwater basket weaving, mm -hmm. you need to be giving your children, your students, your families that you're working with key vocabulary every week and you need to teach students how to memorize things properly by themselves. And it's an overlooked skill. But when, you know, as an adult, I have things I have to know right off all the time. And so I actually devote several pages in the book to clearly, explicitly lining out the research, why this matters, what you can do about it, and showing people how you can set up a flashcard system that works. And it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be online. It doesn't have to take up a great deal of time of your practice, but it is absolutely crucial. And in fact, my students really get into it. I had a middle school biology class last year where the most popular student in the class was the one who created the card deck for the class and he shared it with his peers and, and they loved it. They all loved it. And so perhaps, you know, and maybe that's kind of part of the, the answer here, because the point is, as you said earlier, you know, there are a lot of teachers who haven't um, specifically been trained in online teaching. And yet we know that, you know, due to circumstance or otherwise, some of them are going to be forced into it. And so, you know, ultimately what's in their control and what's not. Uh, so, you know, particular techniques like that for, for a teacher who is in a situation where they need to uh, do online instruction, but they have not received particular training in online teaching. Um, but, you know, what they need to do right now is just do the best they can. I mean, are there certain go-to techniques that you would start with, you know, as a starting point to say, all right, well, here's things you should know and do, and, you know, and, and this is what's in your control. But what's in your control is how quickly you put out expectations to students. Just like in a face-to-face -face classroom where that first day of class where you set up your routines and your rituals, this is how we walk in, this is how we sit down, this is how you ask a question, this is how you turn things in, this is how you address your peers. All of those expectations remain the same. N maybe not the exact same expectations, but the idea that you give students these, that you will tell them what you want them to do and how them to do it, those are all the same. It's kind of interesting because there's not a whole lot of research about how to teach online and there's not um, a great experience with it. So what I've spent the, a great deal of time doing is sort of watching education discussions from the side and reading books about education and 
trying and sometimes failing to adapt those techniques to the online classroom. And so oh, it's amazing how many things that you want in your face-to-face -face classroom can and do translate to online such as setting routines and setting rituals and setting standardized kind of assignments. You're gonna have a quiz every Friday? Great, let's have a quiz every Friday and make it the same style of question. And so students know what to expect because you want students to get into the habit of doing work, like that habitual expectation. Oh, I've got homework tonight. My teacher's gonna expect it tomorrow. The problem is that it's incredibly difficult to start a new habit or routine and do it by ourselves. I mean, if you think about it, like how many of us are they like, oh, I'm gonna eat healthier in January, right? That's the classic, right? We're all gonna, in January, we're all gonna eat healthier. And how many of us do not eat healthier, right? <laughs> um, and so what you need to do is you need to create a sense of community. Like for example, this is why Weight Watchers is so popular is because it creates a sense of community. Does it do anything special? Does it teach you anything that you don't already know? No but what it does is it gives you a peer group right so you got to create that peer group in your classroom to help reinforce these expectations of getting work done and you can do that online and I talk about a lot of subtle nudges and twitches and and pushes and and ways to set that up so that students do feel like they're part of a group which is incredibly important, I think, for students who have been like locked down in a pandemic. And we do have these rolling lockdowns in different areas of the country. And my students this year, more than any other year, are incredibly lonely. They are incredibly lonely. And so I have really kind of kicked all of that into high gear. Mm -hmm. I worry about them, I do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks um, so much, yeah, Courtney, for for being here with us today. The book is the on, the Teaching Online Handbook. And I, before we close, I wanted to ask you know one more thing, just to bring it back to the book uh, and thinking about you know I've had a chance to review the book, and it's there's a lot of substance here. <laughs> there's there's strategies, there's assignments, there's rubrics. I mean, there's lots and lots of stuff here. You know what what is your your hope? for how educators will use this book, um, you know, do, do you, or, or the way that you think that uh, it can be best leveraged, because I think when educators start to dig into it, they're going to see how much content is there and how many different things to dive into. So I think maybe, a, you know, a plan of attack <laughs> is almost helpful to say, all right, here's, here's how I'm going to digest this and put this into my practice. Well, I will say that I wrote it very deliberately in the order in which I would use it. So, you know, what am I doing? What do I need? What tools do I need to get it done? How do I start thinking about it? What things am I going to use in my practice? How do I get started? Where do I put stuff when I do get started? How do I work with parents? How do I actually teach that synchronous session? How do I work with students who have special needs? And then how do I assess it? So it is, in essence, one giant lesson plan <laughs> right. from the hook all the way down to the assessment. But on the other hand, I recognize that it's a really long book. <laughs> it's a big, mm -hmm. it's a big piece of material. And so I think that if you're feeling really desperate, like you, what, were, what can I do tomorrow? I would pick chapter six. <laughs> I would read that one first. All right. Well, that can be helpful, right? Start there and then go back to one and work your way through because um, there is so much, much to learn. And, uh, and we know that educators are coming at this from different levels of experience. And, you know, some really are just getting introduced to how to be successful in online teaching. Others may have been doing it for quite a while, and this is part of their ongoing um, professional learning. And, uh, and there's something for everybody here, right? So yeah, thanks again, Courtney Ostaff, for being with us. For listeners, whether they're schools or educators or parents uh, who want to learn more about you and your work and how you can support them, um, where should they go? I actually made my uh, website. It's CourtneyOstaff.com. And you can follow me on Twitter. It's stuck in the middle. Perfect. And we will uh, share all that information in our show notes as well. Um, thanks again, Courtney Ostaff, for being with us here today. Again, the book is The Teaching Online Handbook, available from John Cat Educational. And uh, go and check that out. Thanks again. <laughs>